Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. We are here in the offices of Dr. Joseph Zapala. Dr. Z is my chiropractor and I really wanted to share with you some of the ways that chiropractic can help people. You know, a lot of people think chiropractic and they think, oh, chiropractors crack your back. It's not like that, trust me. I've been under the care of chiropractors for many, many years and they work on all kinds of different body parts. And you know, now that we're working out a lot more than we used to, maybe some issues are coming up and so Dr. Z is going to talk to us a lot about that today. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Z. We really appreciate this. Absolutely, no problem. So welcome to Live Fit. Um, so talk to us a little bit about why somebody might see a chiropractor other than, you know, that kind of stereotypical, oh, my, my back is sore. What else do you do with people? Well, uh, since we train a lot of athletes here, uh, a lot of times we'll find that a a person will develop pain in their ankles, uh, pain in their feet. They might develop plantar fasciitis. Uh, they could develop sore elbows. They could develop a sore shoulder. A lot of things that involve the extremities. And those are the things that we see quite often. Okay, so when he's talking about athletes, he doesn't just mean the professional ball players and people like that that come through here. He means you guys as well. You guys work out like athletes now. If you've been doing Live Fit with us, you are an athlete. So this is, we're really talking about us today. So let's start by talking about maybe some of the issues, you know, with gripping, because obviously we grip a lot when we work with kettlebells. Absolutely. Talk to me about my arms. Uh, well, when it, comes, when it comes to somebody with arms, uh, and, and you're using a lot of uh, things that involve gripping, uh, a lot of times we tend to overuse the muscles in this part of the forearm here. Where we've all been sore with our kettlebells. Absolutely. And what will wind up happening is when these muscles fatigue, a lot of times you'll see in your athletes, they'll start to shrug their shoulders, start to raise their arms up. As these muscles start to give, you start to recruit up the chain. You'll start using your shoulders too much, you'll start using your neck too much. Uh, and oftentimes you can develop tendonitis in the wrist, you can develop tendonitis at the elbow, and those are things we can definitely address. Okay, so if I came in complaining of elbow pain or maybe some problems with gripping, what would you do? Well, the first thing I'll have you do is go ahead and line your back on the table here. One of the first things that people uh, need to realize is that the elbow is a joint just like anything else and it's got an optimum range of motion. And one of the first things we look for is does the elbow function normally? Uh, in, in a normal healthy adult, you should be able to have your elbow face the ceiling and it should be able to take your hand and roll that, roll that palm so it faces the floor, okay? Oftentimes what we see in athletes or anybody that's, that's using kettlebells or dumbbells, that this, this part of the elbow will be up and the wrist will stop. It'll stop short right here. And when that happens, that tells me that this bone on the side of your arm, the radial head, isn't rotating correctly. If that's the case, these muscles will get overloaded, you'll get full of knots in here, uh, you'll get stiff and sore, and you'll feel like you can't grip anymore. So that's a really good test for people to try at home. Hold your arm out and see if you can turn your hand all the way over. If not, maybe you want to have that looked at. Absolutely, that's, that's a great self-check. Uh, I always tell people to uh, take inventory, so to speak, and kind of check yourself out from day to day. It's one of the great things to do for elbows. Moving on to the wrist, uh, again, same thing. The wrist has its normal range of motion. It should be able to come up in extension fairly well. It should be able to come up in flexion fairly well. A simple test, we have two of everything, compare size. Put your hands up, bring them back, bring them forward, and compare. If you feel that one doesn't move the same as the other one, even if there's no pain there, oftentimes uh, people wait for pain, and that's where that's where we run into troubles because they're not able to really assess: is there a functional problem, or do I just hurt? Hmm. Okay. Well, before we started, we were talking a lot about running too. Obviously, you know, with Live Fit, we've all started running and walking a whole lot more than we might have been before. And we were talking about ankles and different styles of running. Absolutely. You tell us about chi running. This is really interesting. I just learned about this. Uh, what's interesting about the different styles of running is uh, most people, when they, when they think about running, they just go out and start moving their legs. They don't think about what they're actually doing. They just land one foot on the ground and land the other foot on the ground. They kind of keep going. Um, chi running is a type of running style where you stay on the ball of your foot or the midfoot the entire time and your heel never comes down. So if I can get one of your shoes here. Uh, oh, I hate to put them over here. Let's take a look at this shoe. This will be a great way to illustrate it. So here, here's a foot coming down. Traditional runners, the heel comes down, then the midfoot comes down, and then you come off of your toe and you push off. In, in chi running, what happens is the midfoot lands first and you stay on your toes the entire time throughout the stride. You never bring your heel down. And what that does is it allows the, uh, the, the muscles of the body to absorb impact better. When you bring your heel down, the shock wave travels from that heel through the entire leg 
up the hip into the spine and you can get a lot of problems with lower backs when you have somebody running with their heels down a lot, especially an inexperienced runner. Okay, so the other thing we talked about with chi running, and you probably do this when you're sprinting anyway. When you're sprinting, you're usually on your toes most of the time. So with the chi running, and same with sprints, run until your heart rate's really high, and then walk and walk it off. So it's like the walk run that we talked about in one of our other videos as well. Run for a little bit, walk until you catch your breath, run again. So which, which from our perspective as chiropractors is a really smart way to do things because if you continue to run beyond the point where you're fatigued, that's when your form changes, that's when injuries happen. Things like plantar fasciitis, ankle problems, those things all start to creep up when you get tired. Exactly, same as we talk about in the gym. You, know, you have to push yourself, but don't be stupid about it. If you need to stop and rest to keep your form, then that's what we do. So let's talk about ankles and knees and running and, and hips and all of that stuff. You Absolutely, that on the table? let's come up on the table again. So one of the, the most common things we see when we're dealing with runners uh, or anybody who's using running as part of the training is plantar fasciitis. And everybody has this great mystery about what is plantar fasciitis. Well, plantar fasciitis is very simple. It is a uh, fascial plane. It's a, basically a, a mass of, of tendons on the bottom of your foot that attach right to your heel. And so what happens is, if this area gets fatigued, if the, if the foot starts to roll in or what they call pronate, this area can get overstretched and it simply just pulls on the heel, pulls on the attachment, you get tendonitis or plantar fasciitis on the bottom of your foot. Well, what do you do about it? That's, that's the biggest issue. Well, what we do here, again, we always go back to function. Does the ankle move appropriately? You know, oftentimes we'll see, we do the same test we did with the wrists earlier. Can you bring your, your toes back appropriately? Oftentimes I'll see that, like in Alicia's case, she brings her toes back beautifully on both sides. She doesn't feel any jamming in the ankles here. She feels a great stretch in both of her calves. Most folks, however, if we'll go this way, they'll, they'll stop short right here, and this one will come all the way back, and you'll, you'll see that, hey, I can't really bring this, this ankle back all the way. That usually will indicate there's some tension that's built underneath here. And so in order to treat that, what we'll do is first optimize the joint. We'll still get, we'll get the joint back to moving again. And the way that would look if she had a problem is we would simply get on the joint where the issue is, come in here, and we'd perform a correction and actually adjust that joint and get it to function back again where I can get a full stretch on her calf, get this plantar fascia to the full length that it's supposed to be, and the man that condition can actually heal. Now when you adjusted my ankle about a month ago, was that that was felt like the similar sort of adjustment that you did where I jammed it up a little bit? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, at least she had come to me 30 days ago with a very similar situation and it complained of actually some, uh, I believe you were having tibial pain at that mm -hmm. time, what a lot of people call shin splints, same kind of condition, related to the same problem. If this joint is not functioning properly, for example, if this doesn't come back all the way in dorsiflexion, what will happen is this muscle will shorten. Every time you run and bring your foot down with this muscle staying short, this starts to cramp up, it can actually pull on the actual tibial bone here and give you a condition there. And so it's very important that we optimize the function of the ankle. This is, a, is what's called a Graston tool, and we use this for soft tissue treatment. So if someone does have a chronic condition where they've got a bunch of knots on the bottom of the foot, this is a great way to get in and kind of remove the scar tissue. You can kind of feel mm -hmm. a little grit on the bottom of your foot there. Yes, okay? I can. <laughs> uh, in, in, in really bad cases, it'll be like I'm going over speed bumps the whole time. You'll, hear, you'll actually hear it across the room. It'll sound like gristle on the bottom of your foot. This is an excellent tool to break that up. Another tool that we use is we'll use a cold laser. If someone is really inflamed and they've got an actual injury now uh, and they're trying to get inflammation out of the foot, we'll use something called a cold laser. This is a state-of-the-art way to get rid of inflammation. Uh, in the old days, we would use ultrasound. Now we use things like cold laser. Uh, this particular one is handheld, very portable, so I can take it off-site with me if I need to with athletes. And we simply turn this on to the appropriate setting, hit the button on the area where we're having the, having the issue, and then the laser starts doing its thing. And basically what this will do is so you'll, get, you'll feel a little bit of heat sometimes from this, but usually not. And what it does, it actually helps cycle inflammation out of the mitochondria at the cell level. Mm -hmm. So we're helping inflammation on the cell level for athletes. Wow, I can't feel it at all. And this is completely painless and it shuts off when it's done. Mm -hmm. And you'll find, we find that we get great results with this kind of tool. Wow, amazing. Now, the one other thing that we did talk about a little bit was the upper back and, you know, especially, you know, if, if you are obese or if you've been obese, especially if you carry a lot of your weight right in your front, 
it tends to lock up the upper back. And I know a lot of people complain about upper back and neck pain and headaches Absolutely. and things like that. Talk to me a little bit about like why that locks up and you know what effect that has on the shoulders. Because obviously, if your spine is locked up, your shoulders aren't going to work properly either, right? Absolutely. Well, you hit the nail on the head, Alicia. When you when you've got someone that's that's overloaded, if I can have you stand this way. Uh, you know, you can see Alicia's got wonderful posture, and the way I know that is. <laughs> she's got, if she lets her arms hang down, you can see how the how her palms, like you can see the back of her palm from that angle right there. And some with poor posture, you're going to see the palms face the back of her. Your shoulders are going to protract and run forward, and you're going to actually see her palms from behind from this view. So when I see her standing there just naturally, she stands with her palms correctly. When someone's obese or overweight or, or has large breasts or anything that's going to pull them forward, this comes forward. Now automatically what happens is the traps start to fire. The shoulder blades separate, the neck starts to get tension, so you get full of knots in through here, and you actually overload the upper thoracic spine. And in, in, in cases where that, that happens, it's very simple as a chiropractor to fix that. So if you want to sit right over here, have a seat. The, the fix involves a couple things. Number one, you want to make sure that you get the joints unloaded again, get these back to the normal position, and then teach the person to have some kind of balance in here. So we've got to stretch the pectoral muscles and strengthen it back here. So the first thing we would do is we get her to cross her arms here, okay, like that. I'd have her take a breath in, blow all the air out, come straight back on your back for me all the way down. Your head come down right in here, and then there it goes right there. Okay, and that's a simple upper back correction uh, to take away the stress out of the upper spine. And the amazing thing about that, my upper back tends to lock up a little bit, and I think it's just because I stand up straight all day, and I think my muscles get a little tight or something, but it's something that has happened for me probably for 10 years in my life. It's amazing how much better I feel after that one little hug, and you just lean on me, and it's like getting a little hug, <laughs> and I get up, and I honestly, I feel better. You know, I feel like I can breathe more freely, and I just feel looser, and it's really amazing. Well, and there's a reason that you feel better, and you can breathe better. The actual nerves that feed the lungs, if you turn around again so you can see this, the upper thoracic spine between T2 to T4 in here, that's where the nerves are that actually feed the lungs. So I have patients that come in, whether they're asthmatic or whether they have difficulty taking a deep breath in. A lot of times, Alicia, people take it a step further, they'll tell me, hey, if I take a deep breath in, I got a sharp pain that goes right through my chest, like a knife going through me. A lot of times that's a rib that's out of place up in here. This is also very common in athletes that have upper back pain. And let me show you what that would look like. Go ahead and lie back on your back again. You come back all the way flat this time for me. A lot of times people will get a rib cage that will go out of place and people think, well, rib cage, that's, that's this. How do these go out of place? Well, your ribs go all the way up to your neck and your first ribs are all the way up in this area and oftentimes that will misalign. If that's the case, you can very easily get pain in your shoulder, your upper back. Uh, you talk about uh, uh, someone using a kettlebell and they're using a kettlebell and they're using their arms. If this area is misaligned and goes forward like you're talking about, you can get rib injuries fairly easily. This is the fix. We get them in this position, we assess where the dis dysfunction is, and the correction would look something like this. We get their arm in this position, we lift them up this way, come into here, okay? We get her elbow at the ceiling, have her take a breath in, blow it all the way out, simply move the shoulder back, and bang, and the ribs go right back in. And that again solves a lot of upper back problems. I've had that adjustment quite a few times. <laughs> that happens to me a lot. And you've watched that happen to Laurie in the gym. She was plagued by rib problems for the first few weeks of our workouts. She saw a chiropractor, she got it fixed, and now she's doing great. So thank you so much, Dr. Z. That Absolutely. Was really great. I think we all learned a lot. If you have any questions at all, please find us on Facebook. Um, are you on Facebook? Yes, I am. Awesome. Dr. Joseph Zapala on Facebook. Find him. He'd be happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much.